Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about optimizing the tech stack. So that's going to be schema design, um, hardware, and a couple of other various miscellaneous things. Uh, as Chris said, my name is Jack Samplin. I'm the developer evangelist over here at Influx Data. Um, and if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A or in the chat section. Uh, it, and I'll answer those as they come in. Uh, so please, please feel free to do that. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So what are we going to cover today? Um, we're going to briefly go through the data model. Uh, we're going to understand trade-offs involved in schema design. We're going to figure out some best practices there. We're going to talk through hardware requirements. And we're going to talk about performance, another couple of performance trade-offs in schema design. So very heavy on performance trade-offs in schema design today. So important to remember about the InfluxDB data model, tags are indexed, fields are not indexed, and all points are indexed by time. So if we back up a little bit, um, for each database instance of InfluxDB, if you open up the open source, that's going to have databases inside it. Each of those databases has many retention policies. Each of those retention policies has measurements, which are essentially tables in SQL. And within those tables, those tags, which are indexed, are kind of like indexed columns. And the fields, which are not indexed, are just kind of like normal columns with data in them. And everything is indexed by time. So while we're going forward, please be sure to remember that. So when we're talking about schema design, there's a few no-nos, and we're going to go through the no-nos. Feel free to drop them in the Q&A or in the chat section, uh, and I'll answer. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about optimizing the tech stack. So that's going to be schema design, um, hardware, and a couple of other various miscellaneous things. Uh, as Chris said, my name is Jack Samplin. I'm the developer evangelist over here at Influx Data. Um, and if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A or in the chat section. Uh, it, and I'll answer those as they come in. Uh, so please, please feel free to do that. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So what are we going to cover today? Um, we're going to briefly go through the data model. Uh, we're going to understand trade-offs involved in schema design. We're going to figure out some best practices there. We're going to talk through hardware requirements. And we're going to talk about performance, another couple of performance trade-offs in schema design. So very heavy on performance trade-offs in schema design today. So important to remember about the InfluxDB data model, tags are indexed, fields are not indexed, and all points are indexed by time. So if we back up a little bit, uh, for each database instance of InfluxDB, if you open up the open source, that's going to have databases inside it. Each of those databases has many retention policies. Each of those retention policies has measurements, which are essentially tables in SQL. And within those tables, those tags, which are indexed, are kind of like indexed columns. And the fields, which are not indexed, are just kind of like normal columns with data in them. And everything is indexed by time. So while we're going forward, please be sure to remember that. So when we're talking about schema design, there's a few no-nos, and we're going to go through the no-nos, and then we're going to talk about what to do after that. So if we look here, many of you might be familiar with this format, cpu.server5.us-west, and then a single value field and a timestamp. This is graphite, essentially. Um, 
And this encodes a lot of information in tags and makes it very hard to query for. So if you wanted to pull up just the statistics for server five, you'd have to write a regular expression that pulled that data out separately or to pull all your servers from the US West. Um, those queries are non-performant. Uh, this leads the database to storing the data in a non-performant way. Please don't write Graphite directly into the database with no tagging at all. What we would like you to do is encode that information as tags instead. And, and if you look down, you'll see the same points in tag format. So many plugins that you're going to have, like Sinsu or Collect D spits out Graphite. There's a number of other collectors, the Diamond Collector being one of them that I can think of. Um, so what if I have something that sends data like this? Well, there's a couple of tools that we offer that can sit between your data source and InfluxDB, run the data through a parser, and add those tags based on these period delineated strings. And uh, this graphite template parsing language is available in a uh, service for the core database itself in FluxDB, as well as, um, as a parser plugin in Telegraph. And if you see here, um, the first part of the template, sensu.metric.star, that's the filter. So I'm saying four points that match this regular expression. Start with sensu metric. This is how I need to parse them. And each of the periods in the template maps to a period in your uh, string there. So we're going to ignore sensu metric. We're going to call the measurement net. This column here is server. This is an interface tag. And then these are the field names. So you get points that look like this down there. Any questions about that? Cool. Another bad thing to do is overload tags. Um, this graphite style schema here, hostname.datacenter, um, all under server. This makes the data more difficult to query for um, and doesn't give you anything. Um, it's also not intuitive too. So separate that data out into different tags. That allows you to query by region and by host. And also if somebody is trying to plug in a host name and wondering why nothing gets returned, it's because there's .us west on the end of it. Another bad idea, don't use tags that have high variability, UUIDs, hashes, or random strings. Uh, now, the important caveat here to remember is that most of your use cases will have a UUID that you need to filter by. That's totally fine, like sensor ID or host ID. You'll have a number of those. but that's a fixed number. The number of hosts you have is based on how large your installation is. And that's nothing to worry about. But if you're trying to add like a row ID to InfluxDB, I've seen folks do this. Um, they're familiar with SQL databases. They're wondering where the primary key is and they try to add a tag that will act as a primary key. Um, that's a very bad idea. It creates a ton of tags and uh, takes up a lot of space in the in-memory index, leading your database to be highly unperformant pretty quickly. Um, so if you do have these requirements, let's say session ID, request ID, those kind of things, um, you can consider vertically sharding across instances using tag prefix groupings. So if you're, maybe you take the first part of your UUID, store that as a tag, there's fewer of those. And uh, you can filter partially by that. Uh, move data from tags to fields. In the example above, moving request ID to a field might help. 
so you're not tracking maybe giving a unique identifier to each request, but just each session. You've got fewer sessions in the day, so that's not as much of an issue. Um, another thing that you can do to add more series cardinality to the database is to use a cluster. This allows you to horizontally shard series across multiple instances. Tags that are independent have a cost associated with them. So what does that mean? Um, so if you look at um, week, weekday, hour, and minute, whichever one of those has the highest number of values is going to determine the rest of the tags. But host over there is completely independent of those time-related tags. So for every separate host, that's going to create a unique series for all of those time-related tags. Um, that leads to very high cardinality because it's the multiple of both of those tag the number of tag values in each of those different tags is the number of series that will be created. So um, independent tags do have that cost of creating a lot of series in the database. So something to make sure to make sure to be aware of. And again, column, columns can be stored as fields instead. Um, and, and you can do where lookups on those. The only thing you're not going to do is group by. But in this example, grouping by hour or week is you can accomplish that with the time base of the, the database itself. And again, the converse of this is that dependent tags have minimal cost. Now, the, the best example I can think of in this is location. So if you have a sensor ID that has a location associated with it, you can add a lot of tags describing that location without adding any additional cardinality. And that's if this sensor lives in one place. Let's say it's monitoring temperature on the outside of a building. Um, it's got a zip code. It's got a state. It's got a uh, country code. So you can add all of those additional tags without adding any additional cardinality because sensor ID is going to be the thing that you have the most of as far as tag values, and all of the rest of them are dependent on that sensor ID. In this example, we're adding first name as a tag um, for email, and because each one of those first names in the emails maps closely to one email, you're not adding any additional series. You're just adding more descriptiveness and more ability to query your data. Using the same name for a tag in a field is uh, it's a bad practice. It leads you to have to use special query syntax to retrieve the data. Um, it's very confusing for users and uh, even as somebody who's accidentally designed systems where I did this, <laughs> um, it's confusing for anyone querying the data. Um, so just try not to do that. Um, differentiate those names somehow. So maybe our user tag is like user type, and our user field is user ID. So something to think about there. Using too few tags is a very bad idea. Is a very bad idea. So if we're only tagging our data with the region, um, things that you're probably going to run into, fields are not indexed. So uh, if you're trying to filter by host in a query, there you're going to have to scan all of that data. Uh, it's very expensive. Your queries are going to be slower. Um, Field where lookups versus tag where lookups are generally about an order of magnitude slower. Um, you can't group by fields. And if there's points in the same series, and remember, series is defined by measurement in unique tag set, points in the same series have the same timestamp, the system will store the union of the field sets. So last right wins. 
So you're going to end up overwriting a lot of your data if you have not enough tags and you're not being descriptive enough with your data. Don't write data with the wrong precision. This is a common issue folks run into when they're getting started with the database. Um, you'll, I think by default, the database thinks it's getting nanosecond level precision data. And if you write, let's say, second level Unix timestamps with your JavaScript client or millisecond JavaScript, I think, gives you millisecond Unix timestamps, um, it's going to detect it as the wrong precision and write it as being in 1970. Um, or you might have some timestamp collisions. Uh, this is not optimal per for performance. Writing data way in the past is not what the data database is designed to do. Just don't do this and be aware that this is an issue that you might run into when you're using the database. Don't create too many logical containers. Don't write to too many databases or retention policies. If you're thinking you're going to have hundreds or thousands of databases, there's probably a better way to design that system. Um, I've seen folks split each customer into a separate database um, and, and have up to hundreds or thousands of databases. When you get into the thousands of databases, there there is generally some performance issues. You have start bumping into open file handle limits because of the way we store data on disk. Um, there's a lot more overhead associated with handling all of those files and answering queries. Um, more RAM, additional CPU. Uh, it's difficult to join that data in the database itself. Um, you can use regular expressions to search for multiple measurements within an individual database, but if data is across databases, there's no way to, with the query language natively, uh, to manipulate that data together. Um, you would have to do it client side or with a tool like Capacitor. Uh, and it's just not good practice. So anyway, don't have too many databases. So that's a lot of don't do this, don't do that. What should I do as a conscientious database designer? Um, what I always like to do is start by thinking, what kind of queries do I want to run? Um, by knowing which questions you need to answer out of your data, you can write a performant and working schema for your use case. So if I want to run this query here, what can we deduce about our schema? So if we want to count anything or average it, any arithmetical operations, that's going to need to be a field. So we know that Alice here is going to be a field. Um, tags are stored in the database as strings, so there's no type information associated with them. Um, fields can be Boolean strings or float or int 64s. So those kind of arithmetic operations need to be run on fields. Timestamp collision workarounds, will this be fixed in the future? Uh, I don't know about what you mean about will this be fixed, but the best way to work around timestamp cl cl collisions is to write the data at a higher precision so that you're not having those collisions or to separate your data into more series. Um, it's not generally a problem I see folks run into. Um, if you're using Telegraph or any of the other standard collectors, they do a very good job of avoiding timestamp collisions. Um, just be sure that you're properly describing your data, giving it a lot of enough tags to separate it into enough logical containers, 
and uh, make sure you're writing it with high enough precision where you're not going to run into timestamp collisions. Does that make sense? I'm going to assume that does. If you've got any more questions, Sotorios, uh, just toss them in the chat again. Yes, but with nanosecond precision, we still have collisions. I would say adding more tags to your data. Um, I'd be interested to see where you're getting collisions with nanosecond precision. Um, if you go to community.influxdata.com and share some more details about that, I'd be happy to answer your question. Um, thank you, Satorios. Awesome. Um, so another thing to think about when you're designing schema is only fields can store numbers. I I've chatted about this a few times. Uh, any of that type information, comparisons, you're going to want to store that data as a field. The group life clause cannot accept fields. Um, this is important to understand uh, about schema design and influx. It's just a fundamental limitation of the database. We can't group by fields. We can only group by tags. So anything that's in a group by field, we're going to want it to be a tag. Um, host name, a common one, sensor ID, stuff like that. Group by, tag. And some general things to keep in mind. As we said just a second ago, anything in a group by clause must be a tag. Anything that you want to pass into a function must be a field. Anything that uses comparison operators can be a tag or a field. So obviously greater than or less than, it needs to be a field because it's a uh, numeric operator. But if it's equal to or not equal to, that can be a tag. If you're going to use a regular expression to filter through it, let's say you have some, this is very common in DevOps, you have some information encoded in your host names, and you want to use regular expressions to search through your host names to match a list of hosts, um, that's going to need to be a tag. Um, and then again, if you lose information by storing as a string, use a field. Any questions before I move on to the exercises? Okay, we're going to go ahead and move through the exercises now. So this exercise is going to be a uh, schema design exercise. We've got a number of sensors, about 10,000 of them. So uh, we've, we've been running a very successful business here. Um, we're measuring air quality at a bunch of different points all throughout San Francisco. Um, and these sensors are emitting air quality data every 10 seconds. So when those sensors emit data, this is the data they emit. So there's some location data, zip code, latitude, longitude, city name, and device ID. And then there's some pollution data. So smog level, CO2 parts per million, atmospheric lead, sulfur dioxide, So as an exercise, why would it be a bad idea to make latitude or longitude a tag instead of a field? And uh, if you have any ideas on this, just drop it in the chat. I'm going to mute my mic here for just a second and, and let you guys think about this question. And Paul's got it right. Too many possible values is going to lead to some high cardinality there. 
um, as you know, uh, latitude and longitudes generally high precision floats. <laughs> Those aren't known for low cardinality. So um, do try to avoid using lat or long as a tag instead of a field. One thing that I found very helpful with geographic use cases like this is uh, geohashing and using um, just a very short prefix of the geohash to group things into areas to query over um, by your tag values. And then you can store the full precision geohash or the latitude and longitude as a uh, field and pull out that exact location data. And uh, that works pretty well for location-based data. So as we just talked about, they're both going to have a high cardinality and could result in a large number of series. The next, um, what would be a good idea to make them tax instead of fields? Um, fast lookups on latitude and longitude. Um, grouping by these latitude and longitudes. Maybe we're not storing super high precision uh, latitude and longitudes. We're just storing maybe one decimal place, so relatively large areas, and we can wear search by those. Um, if our devices don't move, latitude and longitude might be dependent on device ID, and storing them won't increase series cardinality. So those are considerations to think about. So as we're designing this schema, the following queries are important. Um, we're going to call our measurement pollutants. Uh, we've got a couple of things we need to group by. And we've got a couple of things that we need as uh, fields. We need to aggregate or otherwise perform arithmetic operations on them. So what's the best way to organize our data to support the queries we want? And uh, if you think about this, we're basically thinking about from this, these queries here, what are we going to want as tags and what are we going to want as fields? So I'm going to give you guys a second to think through this, and then we're going to talk through a couple of different possible schemas. OK. so. Let's go over the, the schema for this problem here. So how are we going to organize our data to support the queries we want? Well, here's one potential schema. Um, here's one potential schema. Um, we've got a measurement pollutants. We've got tags, city, device ID, and zip code. And then we've got a bunch of fields, lat, long, smog level, CO2 parts per million, lead, and sodium dioxide level. And here is uh, a couple of example points in line protocol. Another potential schema would be the same as the last one, except we would have those latitude and longitude values as tags. Does anyone have any questions or comments about either of those schemas? Which one do we think would be best? And what are the pros and cons of either of those? OK, moving on. Hardware requirements. So if you're running the database, uh, you're going to want to understand how large of a machine you're going to need to run it on based on your workload. Um, InfluxDB as a database is known for its performance. So we're not, um, we're pretty good with your hardware, but there are some things to keep in mind. Um, it, this is going to depend pretty heavily on your load profile. So how many values a second? Um, each one of those field values uh, needs to get persisted to disk. Um, so the amount of field values you have coming into the database every second will help determine your load, essentially. 
Um, another part of load is the number of queries. Uh, that's going to affect memory consumption. And then obviously unique series that we've talked about a few times, that's also going to affect memory consumption, your indexes. Um, so if we look here, 25,000 values a second, five queries a second, less than 100,000 unique series, you can run that on very small hardware, and then obviously moderate and high loads. And then the performance limits of a single server, anything over a million values a second, more than 100 queries a second, um, generally I'd say that's around between 20 and 50 um, people in chairs refreshing Grafana, <laughs> um, and then over 10 million unique series. Uh, Paul has a question. Are there any metrics collected by Telegraph that may allow us to see what our current load profile may be? Yes, um, Telegraph has an InfluxDB plugin that gets a lot of these values. Um, I would check out the documentation on that. Uh, the number of series in the database is in there definitely. The number of writes a second is in there. Um, and the number of queries per second you can pull out as well. So. Um, Telegraph, the Telegraph Influx DB plugin has all of this. So for those load profiles there, these are the different um, hardware requirements you're going to want. Low load, you can handle pretty gracefully on two to four CPU cores and two to four gigs of RAM. Influx DB being written in Go uh, does effectively utilize multiple cores. We've got a number of background processes. So having at least two CPUs to make the database run performantly is a good idea. Uh, yes, Sotorios, the internal database does have some of that information as well. Um, the write throughput especially is going to be in the internal database. And I believe the series counts are in there as well, but you might need the Telegraph plugin to pull those out. Um, and then moderate load, four to six CPU cores, eight to 32 gigs of RAM, depending on um, obviously the number of series and your query load. Um, and then we do advise folks run on SSDs. So uh, those IOPS requirements are very low for most SSDs, but uh, just something to be aware of. Um, running on spinning disk will reduce your write throughput by about two thirds. And then for high load or any pretty serious production load, I do recommend that folks always run eight or more cores. Um, and in that high load scenario, you're gonna have a lot of series and queries. So 32 gigs, 32 gigs or more of RAM. I've seen folks run with um, hundreds of gigabytes of RAM depending on the, the number of series. And obviously that number is a little bit more flexible than the CPU's number, but uh, just something to keep in mind. General performance tips, we are pretty CPU heavy um, and different workloads can be memory heavy as a caveat to that. Um, when I do testing on AWS, I use the C3 series. Memory usage is most heavily correlated with the number of unique series in the database. I've said that a number of times. <laughs> it's an important thing to understand about Influx. It's something that kind of separates time series databases from other databases. Is the fact that we keep those series keys in memory for those very quick lookups. Um, we Anything that requires a lot of queries is also going to require additional memory. So let's say you're more in that low load scenario in terms of number of series and um, amount of values you're writing every second, but you have a lot of people looking at those dashboards, um, additional memory, and then you might start seeing some CPU contention um, when you start scaling up those clients as well. So just something to keep be aware of. And Please run the database on SSDs. It just runs better. Storage requirements. A lot of folks want to know how much storage am I going to need to satisfy my use case? I need to store all of this data for a year or forever. Um, 
when you're calculating storage space for influx, does downsampling improve performance? We do have a question here, Satorius. Uh, does downsampling improve performance? Um, that's an interesting question. Yes and no. Um, so downsampling will essentially reduce your his the size of your historical data on disk, but that historical data that's on disk doesn't have a whole lot of bearing on most of the queries that you're going to end up doing. Um, if you're using the database to do DevOps monitoring or for an Internet of Things application where people are looking at current sensor values more often, or even a financial use case where you have stock market data streaming in, what you really care about is now and the last 15 minutes or the last hour. Um, that data is always going to be in a current shard within the database and will be uh, very performant. That old downsampled data um, is going to be performant for long-term queries. So let's say you're querying for a year of data, trying to pick out some trends. That will make those queries more performant. Um, so in that way, downsampling improves performance, but there's no downside to having all of that data on disk. It's if you're not querying it, we're not going to really pull it up and keeping it around is fairly cheap. So uh, good. Thank you. Um, so non string fields take up approximately three bytes per point. So the way I normally say that is three bytes per floater integer value. So 1 billion points is around three gigs on disk. Um, string values require variable space as determined by string compression. Um, the string compression algorithm we use is snappy. So uh, I think that's generally around 60% compression. And obviously that depends on how many times values are repeated. Let's say you're storing an alert state as a field value. There's going to be a lot of repeated values there. We'll store pointers to those values and they'll reduce very well. So just depending on the data you write there. An important thing to remember is that measurement names, tag keys, and tag values are only stored once per series, not per point, and have very minimal impacts on storage needs. So um, load up on those tags if they're descriptive and not um, in conflict. And that's our webinar today. Um, I'm happy to stay around and take questions. I'll be here for the next 10 to 15 minutes, um, and I'll be answering the chat and the Q&A. Uh, I hope everyone got a lot out of this webinar, and thank you all very much. So it looks like there's one question in the Q&A. Um, John asks, can you comment on adding an alert flag as a field versus a separate measurement? Example, temperature over a range. John, I, I'm... Can I see this video again? Uh, Mikhail, we will upload uh, we will upload this video, um, and I think Chris is going to send this out. Um, John, as to your question there, um, how how would you store it as a separate measurement? I, I'm not quite uh, understanding that. If it's an alert flag, it might want to be a tag too. Um, you might want to group by an alert state and figure out which hosts are in, a, in an individual alert state. Um, but having it as a measurement, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite understanding what you're saying there. Um, if you could add some clarifying there, I, I would appreciate that. Will cross measurement queries come in the future? So Torios. Um, so you can query across measurements currently. You can query across multiple measurements using regular expressions in your from clause. Um, it's not very performant, but it's doable. As far as like cross measurement joins, 
Uh, I do know that those are features that are on the roadmap. So uh, yes, I, I do hope to get those eventually. Um, Mikhail asks, we try to use TickScript, but we have a problem with capacitor because we have a time lag between hosts in InfluxDB and capacitor. That's uh, OK. Um, yeah. John, sorry, meant tag as opposed to measurement. Um, it, John, it, it really depends on your use case. Um, for tags, generally those uh, sensor alerts, there's a few different states. So they're really not going to add a whole ton of cardinality, uh, and you're going to want to maybe group by those. Um, probably storing as a tag would generally be advantageous. However, there's I've definitely seen people store them as fields. And, and I've had use cases where storing sort of an alert state like that as a field, um, maybe it's not super critical to have, but is nice and descriptive. Um, and my client side application needs to do something with that value. Uh, in that case, storing as a field is just cheaper. So uh, does that make sense? Awesome. So, Mikhail, it sounds like you've got a lot of uh, dead man alerts that are firing inaccurately due to time lag between influx and capacitor. Um, if that's the case, I would suggest trying to reduce the uh, latency between influx DB and capacitor. We normally run them in either on the same host, uh, if it's a smaller installation or on hosts that are available in the same data center over a virtual private network um, to reduce latency between them. Ideally, InfluxDB does not have to travel over the open internet to reach capacitor. That's pretty slow. So reducing that latency would be uh, the way to go there. How can we disable tasks for maintenance hosts? Um, that's a... maybe for sync MPTD. Um, that's a feature that's coming in the future for capacitor. There's no way to currently disable alerts um, without disabling the entire tick script. This also depends on exactly how your tick scripts are laid out, Mikhail. Um, Satorius asks, capacitor and influx DB on the same machine is okay for performance? Um, short answer, no. Long answer, it depends on how much performance you need out of them and how large the machine is. Um, but for lower load scenarios, that's OK. For higher load scenarios, please do be sure to separate those on the separate machines. Um, does that answer your question? Mikhail, did I did I get to your question there about the capacitor stuff? I, I there was a number of different issues there, and I was trying to uh, trying to answer that. Did I did I get everything for you? So we had a couple of more questions in here. Satorios asks, capacitor getting data from another source than influx to make decisions. Um, yes, Satorios, uh, capacitor. I like to think of it kind of as having a front end and a back end. The front end ingests data and the back end spits out alerts and uh, manipulated data. Um, any source that writes in InfluxDB line protocol can be routed through capacitor. So you can use Telegraph to write directly to capacitor and make alerts that way. I've definitely uh, used capacitor in that configuration before, and it absolutely works great. So yes, you can do that. Um, I'm late and I didn't see about the Docker stack. Um, where can I see the video? Uh, Chris will send out an email to this video uh, afterwards. And this particular video was not about Docker. Um, we did a webinar earlier this week on using the tick stack and Docker Swarm and auto scaling there. That video will be up soon as well. 
It's actually live already, so oh. I'll, I'll put the link in here. Oh, excellent. Okay, cool. So, uh, Mikhail, if you're looking about that Docker stuff, we do have that. So, um, yeah. Is, is that the Docker, the, are those the Docker things that you were looking for? It looks like we lost Mikhail.